Welcome to the Indian Silicon Valley podcast. I'm your host, Jivraj, and today I have with me an extremely special guest. Join me in welcoming Matt Abrahams, the co-founder of Bold Echo Communications and a professor at the Stanford Graduate School of Business. Thank you so much, Matt, for joining me. I'm absolutely delighted to be hosting you today. I am thrilled to be here and excited about our conversation. Thank you so much, Matt. And I must mention that I, for one, truly believe that communications can be Communication can be such an important tool to leverage, especially for early stage founders and operating teams. And as we leverage this conversation as a masterclass on communications, I want to go over a bunch of aspects, but I want to start with the fundamental reasoning as to why communications is even important and why might we require the constant or cognizant recognition of the fact that we need to work on our communication. So over to you to establish the ground rules of why is it important to begin with. Well, communication is fundamental to how we interact as, as humans, and it allows us to collaborate, it allows us to be creative, it allows us to be able to plan our actions strategically. So focusing on communication is critical to the success of most endeavors that we undertake, but especially founding a business. It is critical to think about not only how as entrepreneurs will we communicate as a team, as a founding team, but also how will we work with our customers, our prospects, our funders. So communication underlies what I believe is all critical elements of entrepreneurial endeavors. Absolutely. I think that sets it up perfectly well. And if you might give us a more in-depth overview of what are some of the finer details of how founders leverage communication. It could be selling to a consumer. It could be providing feedback to a fellow team member. It could be seeking feedback from a prospective consumer and multiple other things that go into the finer details of leveraging the art of communication. So if you can focus on that and maybe help us understand those details, that would help. Sure. And, and what you're articulating are very uh, tactical elements of communication. Communication yeah. helps us get our ideas across. It helps us pitch. It helps us collaborate. It helps us get feedback uh, and deliver feedback. So those are essential. It helps us manage conflict and disagreement. But at a more strategic level, communication helps us articulate our vision and our mission. As founders, it is essential to be able to articulate what is it that you are trying to accomplish? What need are you filling? What opportunity are you trying to take advantage of? And it is only through communication that you can communicate that vision and mission. So it is essential that everybody not only have the passion and the knowledge and know-how to initiate your business idea, you must be able to communicate it successfully. That's the only way you'll get customers, it's the only way you'll build a team and it's the only way you can get funding to move forward. So without thinking through and developing communication skills, you are going to be at a disadvantage for sure. Absolutely. I don't think I can agree more to that. And as we proceed to understand the how of it, now that we've gotten the why and what, uh, can you help us understand how might a founder, given the different barrage of things that he has to do, he or she has to do on a daily level, how can they perhaps prioritize the art of communication and become better at it, almost inculcate it as a habit to become better in the long run? Yeah, I wouldn't say almost. I would say it is essential to, to inculcate as is, is a habit and, and a focus. You know, I've been doing what I do for a long time. Uh, I coach and I teach people strategic communication skills and, and practical uh, applied communication skills. And every experience I have had has taught me that what you put in up front really can save you effort on the back end. So what does that mean? That means as part of founding your company, thinking through your business plan, think about from the get-go, how will we communicate this? Let's make communication and transparency and collaboration a priority, a founding part of our mission and vision. Therefore, we can build three essential elements to a, a successful business in terms of communication. And that is the infrastructure, the people and the processes you put in place around communication. So it means that as a founder, when you first convene with your co-founders or prospects or advisors, that you set an agenda that's clear. It means that you practice the messaging you want to deliver. It means you get used to recording yourself and watching and listening. You reach out to others for, for help as well. 
Because at the end of the day, there are only three essential ways to get better at communication. And that is repetition, reflection, and feedback. You have to practice. It's just like a sport or a musical instrument you, you take on. You have to practice, practice, practice. You have to reflect what worked and what didn't. You know, there's that saying that, that the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. Many of us communicate in that way. We just do what we've always done without ever reflecting. And that doesn't allow for growth. And then you have to seek feedback. You have to look for coaches, for classes, for tools, uh, podcasts. To, to learn from, to help. So it is essential to build it into the foundation of your organization, of your business, and to take it upon yourself as a task to get better. Absolutely. I think uh, the truer words have not been spoken, and it's important that we emphasis on mastering the art of communication. I think legend has it that Steve Jobs would practice 48 hours before he would ever deliver a presentation, right? And if he can, which is one of the most epic presenters of our time, I think we ought to. Um, well, it wasn't just 48 hours. He practiced <laughs> months and yeah. months in advance. And if you, if any of your listeners enjoy TED Talks, those, those folks practice a ton. They are coached. You know, the, it, there are some people who are naturally gifted as good communicators, but even they can get better. But all of us, all of us can improve. I, I, I have seen it in my own life. I've seen it in my teaching and in my coaching. You just have to focus on it and make it a priority. Absolutely. Matt, as we proceed, can you help us decode perhaps that what are some of the best ingredients or the best communicator that you've seen as a founder? And what are some traits that evidently stand out for them such that we can perhaps map it in our own actions and our you know, own practices? So rather than name an individual, what I'd like to do is name several characteristics that are an amalgamation of things that I've seen from different people. First is humility the ability to approach uh, your communication as something that can be improved. Uh, many of us, when there's an area that we're uncomfortable with, try to protect uh, ourselves from dealing with it and cover it up from others. So, so humility and giving yourself permission to, to explore and advance this and to be open to feedback is absolutely critical to improve communication. Second, the ability to observe others communication and begin to notice what works and what doesn't work for others can be critical to getting better. So in a non-judgmental way, as you're listening to others speak, say, wow, I'm really impressed by how she does that, or I'm really curious how that person benefits from that other behavior. Third, I would say being a good listener. You know, communication is a two-way street, and many of us focus on what we say, being the sender, but being the receiver is critical, and listening is often overlooked in effective communication. Fourth, I would say getting out of your own way. We put a tremendous amount of pressure on ourselves to be right in our communication, and I'm here to tell you there is no right way to communicate. There are better ways and worse ways, but there is no one right way. And then finally, I would say the fifth of these characteristics that I've noticed in entrepreneurs who are successful is the ability to pivot and to adjust and adapt as necessary. So that flexibility is the fifth category. So, you know, does everybody have those characteristics? No. Can you develop and focus on them? Certainly. But those are the five characteristics that I think are most critical, not only for founders, but for anybody looking to improve their communication. Great. I think I, I see a stark resemblance to all of those characteristics in similar to being an entrepreneur as well. The entrepreneurial mm -hmm. characteristics have so much of it, and it's great to see the resemblance there. Um, I think I want to ask a rather abstract question now and understand from you as to how can communication and effective communication be leveraged as a tool to perhaps establish a winning culture, right? As we focus on culture and org building as founders, how do you think can communication be leveraged as a tool to not just carry it down, but also inculcate across the chain and maybe, you know, better the culture of the organization? Thank you so much for asking that question. So many entrepreneurs and so many people treat communication as a necessary evil rather than a strategic element. So I am a huge proponent of building a communication infrastructure within a company. 
Now that includes technology, but it is not exclusive to technology. You have to have the tools available to allow people to communicate and you have to prioritize and explain which tools are used for which type of communication. Do you call somebody? Do you Slack somebody? How do you communicate? That's part of it, but that's a foundational part of it. You must set up a, a value chain around communication. In other words, you have to establish the fact that communication is paramount to everything that we do. Things like transparency, the willingness to allow people to fail or to make mistakes and communicate those mistakes. These are things that not only have to be put into the wording of the mission and the vision and the values, but they also have to be practiced and demonstrated by senior leadership. I believe when people are hired, communication, not just in how the interview goes, but talking about the fact that communication, collaboration, transparency are critical. And how has the candidate you're interviewing use those skills, practice those skills, put emphasis on those skills. Then as a leader and as the organization grows, when you do performance reviews of people or you in your meetings, talk through things, bring communication to the forefront. I think it would be wonderful if at the beginning of every company, as people were, were setting down their individual goals, what they're trying to achieve, if communication and improving communication were part of that. At the end of every major meeting an organization has, take 30 seconds to a minute at the end of those meetings to reflect on the quality of the communication, not the decisions that were made, but how did we communicate as a team? If you do those things, communication then becomes your, a strategic tool for you to be effective. I have been called in as a consultant countless times to fix broken communication. It is so much easier especially as founders, to build these things in up front so you do not need to triage them on the back end. Absolutely. I could not agree more. And I love all of those pointers. Uh, I think I also want to take a minute and understand more regarding storytelling, right? As mm -hmm. we go ahead and talk to founders, everyone emphasizes on the point of the importance of storytelling, but often do we hear why and how can we improve it, right? Uh, so if you can help us understand the core elements that go into drafting the right story and then delivering it in a manner that is quintessential for the audience, I think that would really help because storytelling is such a crucial component of being a founder. All right, well, let's all sit back and put on our seatbelts because you've just, you've just given me permission to share a lot of information. So feel free to interrupt me as I go. So uh, the first part of your question is, why is storytelling so important? Well, it, it comes down to biology and evolution. Uh, one of my great pleasures is, working at the Stanford Graduate School of Business is I get to host a podcast myself. It's called Think Fast, Talk Smart. And I get to interview really bright people all around the Stanford campus all about communication skills. And I've talked to several people about storytelling. And it boils down to this, our brains are wired for story. They are prepared to receive story, not bullet points, not PowerPoint, but stories. Uh, there's something called episodic memory. We remember things as episodes, as stories. So the reason storytelling is so critical is it matches with what we as humans are designed to entertain and, and focus on. So that's the, that's the why. The question then becomes how. So storytelling is an art and it is an art that can be learned and practiced. To me, a story is something that has a logical flow, a connection to it. In the consulting practice I run, we spend a lot of time in our webinars and workshops talking about storytelling and story development. And it all starts first and foremost with understanding your audience. If you don't understand your audience, you cannot make the story relevant and at the level that is appropriate for them. So the first ingredient, I believe, is to start by understanding your audience. The second step is to really clearly articulate your goal. What are you trying to achieve in your storytelling? And to me, a goal has three critical parts, information, emotion, and action. So as you think about your audience and what they need, your goal must conform to those. So you have to think about what do I want them to know at the end of my story? How do I want them to feel? And what do I actually want them to do? And then that goal allows you to structure a story appropriately. And there are numerous ways to structure stories. We have all suffered and been victims of people who just ramble. Rambling is antithetical to the value of story. 
Story actually helps us from a neuroscience point of view process information more efficiently. So if you don't have a structure, you're not going to be able to communicate your story effectively. So I'll pause there simply to say stories are fundamental to being human. It's all about targeting what your audience needs, creating a goal and structuring the information appropriately. Wow, that's wonderful to hear. And I think uh, we could, that that calls for a separate episode altogether. But for the purpose of this conversation, I would perhaps proceed and maybe double click on the last aspect of what you mentioned in terms of structure. So much of what a founder does and building organizations for the future requires you to have structured communication and lay down the vision that might be in your head, but has to be transferred in a way that can be gullible and understood well. So if you can help us understand how founders can think in structures as opposed to think of uh, distorted visions, which may not be the case, but it's one thing to know everything, to have complete information, and it's another to express it in a manner that can be understandable. So if you can help us bridge that gap, I think that'd be wonderful. Happy to do so. So you're right, structure is critical in that. And, and structure is a very tactical way of taking the vision, the mission, and articulating it. So there are several structures. I, I find two incredibly powerful for founders and people who are early stage in a business venture. The first is, is not a surprise to many people. It is the problem solution benefit structure. You start by articulating what it is that you're trying to fix. What's the problem? And that problem could be something uh, that everybody is aware of and has experienced, or it could be something that people have yet to really think about, but you will define the problem. You then articulate your solution. What are the things that you will put in place, your service, your product, your offering that combats or addresses that problem? And then finally, you talk about the benefits, the benefits to the customer, the benefit to society, whatever. But problem solution benefit is a tried and true structure. Now, two caveats. Sometimes what you're dealing with as a founder or your vision is not really uh, addressing a problem. It's simply seizing an opportunity. There's nothing wrong with what we're doing, but we could do it better. So that's an opportunity. So the structure could be opportunity, solution, benefit. Now, remember I said one of the critical elements is really understanding your audience. If you know you are talking to a very resistant audience, for whatever reason, they're afraid what you're talking about costs too much money or requires too much change, it can actually benefit you to move the benefits part of this structure first. Because research suggests if you get people to buy into the relevance and benefits up front, it reduces their resistance. So this could actually be benefit, problem, solution as a structure. So that is one clear way to pitch what you're doing and to articulate the specific vision and mission that you have. Another structure, if you'll allow me, that I think is wonderfully useful because of its flexibility is the what, so what, now what structure. It is simply three questions that can help you structure information by answering those three questions. So the what is your product, your process, your, your idea, your service, your offering. You define it. You then talk about why it's relevant. That's the so what. What's the value to a prospect, to a customer, to a company? And then the now what is the next step? Let me show you a demo. Let's sign up for another meeting. Let me give you a use case. So what, so what, now what is incredibly powerful, not just for helping you define and explain what it is you do, but for other things as well. You can write your emails in that structure. The, the now what is the subject line, the what and the so what are in the body. You could give feedback in the what, so what, now what structure. If you say, how did I do in that last meeting? I could say, well, you know, it went pretty well, but you spoke fast, that's the what. When you speak fast, it makes it hard for people to understand and really take in what you're saying. That's the so what. And the now what is next time, I'd like you not only to slow down, but to give more examples of what you're saying. So structure can help. It can help you pitch your business, define your vision, give feedback, write emails, think about these structures to help you. Mm. Oh, that's wonderful. And I must confess that so much of your structure has been pivotal in shaping the structure for this podcast as well. And I must recommend that uh, everyone utilize that framework because it helps categorically structure your thoughts in a way that can be easily understood by the audience. So I completely agree and I cannot uh, echo it further. 
Um, Can I add one thing? So you just added a very important point about structure, which is it doesn't only help your audience. It helps you. It helps you structure your thoughts. It helps you remember what to say. So thank you for highlighting that point. It's very important. Glad to. I think further, you know, I'm sure that through the last one and a half years of the COVID era, you've been asked this multiple times, but as leaders and as founders, how important is nonverbal communication and how might we establish that in a manner that can be deliberate, yet giving it the entire importance that it deserves? Because we can tend to keep our video shut, we can tend to do a multiple things that can be detrimental, not in the short run, but in the long run. So if you could help us with best practices in terms of non-verbal communication, I think that would be wonderful. You are so right that the pandemic has put a highlight on nonverbal communication. And for no other reason, people are wearing masks. We see half of people's faces and we realize how much we miss in terms of interpreting what people really mean and if they're really being genuine in what they're saying. So absolutely. So, so nonverbal communication has always been critical and the last year and a half or so has highlighted how important it is. So when it comes to nonverbal presence, first and foremost, we have to ad- address and deal with our anxiety. Confidence is critical. And the more confident you feel, to an extent, obviously, we don't want to be overconfident or arrogant, uh, the, the more natural your nonverbal presence will be. When we are nervous, we, we invoke a whole bunch of nonverbal behaviors that demonstrate our anxiety and distract people from paying attention. That's why I wrote the book I wrote, Speaking Up Without Freaking Out. That's why I I founded the website or curate the website I do called uh, No Freaking Speaking, just to help people manage anxiety. So that's the first step. And there are lots of things we can do to feel more comfortable and confident communicating. Once we're there, we then have to start to invoke behaviors that allow us to demonstrate our confidence. I'll give you a couple of bits of advice, in-person or virtual, and assume this assumes you're showing your video, which all the research suggests is really important to connect and to collaborate, although it can make it more draining. When we see ourselves, it can be really uh, emotionally and uh, mentally draining. So there's a trade-off there. But when people see you, either in person or virtually, a couple bits of advice. First, you want to be big, balanced, and still in your posture. Many of us slouch or we lean or we shift when we speak. It's important to be big, balanced, and still. If you're doing video, as you and I are doing right now, my first recommendation is to sit up straight and to pull your shoulder blades, your scapula bones in your back, down towards your waist. It makes you broader. When you're standing in front of people, the same thing is true. That makes you big. You want to keep your head straight. Many people tilt their heads on video or they lean when they are speaking in front of people. That makes you look less confident. So you want to be big and balanced. And then, as I mentioned, you want to avoid shifting or swaying. If you do those three things, you'll go a long way to looking confident. The second bit of a nonverbal advice is you want to look at your audience. In most cultures, eye contact is really important. In the virtual realm, in order for me to look like I am looking at you, I must look at the camera, which is weird. It's hard to talk to a camera. And if if you're showing your video, I'm going to want to look at your video. But the problem is when I look down at your video, it's as if if we were in person, I was talking to your feet. So the second bit of advice beyond big, balanced, and still is look at your audience. And if you're on video, you have to look at your camera. And then the final thing I'll say is, The brain is wired to be attracted to variation, to novelty, to things that change. So you must vary your voice. If your voice were to sound monotonous like I am doing now, people will tune you out. So you have to have variety in your voice. So it's body posture, it's eye contact and voice. You do those three things, you will come off as confident and you will help people to really pay attention to you. Again, it starts by managing anxiety first. Absolutely. Wow, I love all of those pointers. And I think there's a lot of depth in each one of them. And should we work on them in a strategic manner that can have unparalleled results for the organization in its entirety? Um, I have one last question on this piece before we move on to the closing aspects. But here's an abstract one where so much of what the founder does is also strategize and think. And this could be in silos where they're spending time either with a very small team or with their own selves. 
how important is communication as a tool to structure thoughts and then deliver it? So one part of it can be delivery and the other can be just structuring to think about it. If you can help us decode the earlier, I think that would be great. I, I think that's a very insightful question. Uh, first and foremost, you know, the, the first person we communicate with is ourselves and everything I've talked about applies to that as well. So when, when brainstorming, when plotting, you need to think, you know, who am I plotting for and who am I brainstorming for? So that audience piece is important. You need to think about what's the goal? What am I intending to do with this? And then finally, you, you need to, to leverage structure. So give yourself time to really think about or brainstorm on the idea itself. That's that what part. And then really think about the relevance. How do I take what I've thought and make it relevant? And then what are the next steps to implement? And how do I communicate and cascade the information? So everything we've talked about applies when the audience is ourselves or a very small intimate group of people. But being strategic in that rather than just sitting down and thinking is, is critical. The other thing I'll say is, is we know ourselves or we hope to know ourselves pretty well find tools that work for you. So for example, when I want to brainstorm, I am actually a pretty visual brainstormer. So I will, I will draw circles and write things down. I don't just generate lists. I also know that I'm at my most creative when I'm out running or exercising. So I will, I will purposely build that in. So play to your strengths, play to what works for you. I know other people who do best in the evenings in a quiet room with some, or maybe some mellow music playing. So set up the environment, the environment, the timing, all of that influences how effectively you communicate with others and yourself. Absolutely. I love the emphasis on the final details of communication, which can tend to get missed, but it's great to have you highlight them. I think uh, one last question here is also in terms of now that we've understood through this conversation how we can become better at it, can you perhaps help us understand what are things we need to do or founders need to do to make it a habit to become and continuously work at communications? Because I'm guessing that this is such a journey that you can only keep getting better and there's no one goal to achieve. So as we beckon on that, what are some important tools and traits? What are, what are some resources? I know you have an amazing podcast that has been amazingly pivotal in shaping this podcast, but what do you recommend founders do to include becoming better at communications as a part of their entire habit system, entire lifestyle? Great. Let me let me suggest several things. So so one is intention. You have to focus and put that as an intention. Uh, and then once you have the intention, you have to pay attention to it. So again, uh, my biggest recommendation for individual activity that you can do, and I'll talk about what you can do looking and getting help from external sources, is to build the communication skills you're working on into your daily practice. It is hard to build new habits. So associate new ideas, new behaviors with existing habits. So for example, let me give you an example related to, um, I'll give you two examples. One related to a nonverbal presence skill. There are many people who struggle to have variation in their voice. So what I encourage them to do is to take something you do every day and just do it out loud. So for example, most of us look at our calendar multiple times a day, our diary to see what we're supposed to do during the day. Rather than just reading it mentally, speak it out loud and challenge yourself to play with inflection, to challenge yourself to make sure with the end of your sentences, your volume remains strong. Uh, some of us have children, read to your kids, read out loud, you're already doing it, just focus on how you're using your voice. So take a, a normal behavior, something you're currently doing and add in a communication skill you want to work on. Similarly, many founders, many of us have many meetings during the day. Before you go into the meeting, just ask yourself, what's my goal here? What do I want people to know, feel and do? You're already going into the meeting. You're already thinking about what you're going to say. Just add that additional question. So the first part of my answer to your question is take these new skills and attach them to existing habits. That way you can build them and strengthen them. Second, find resources, mentors, teachers, and help. Uh, I'll share a couple things. One, there are lots of classes available to people. I teach classes through Stanford's continuing studies uh, that are open to people worldwide. Uh, they're consultants and teachers like the Bold Echo 
a company that I co-founded where we offer workshops and webinars. Make yourself available to those. Join Toastmasters, an international organization designed to build leadership and communication skills. It's amazingly accessible all around the world. It's relatively cheap. Find ways to do that. Look for podcasts, look for videos, take the time to really learn, become a student. I always tell people, if you ever played a sport, how did you get better at the sport? And people would say practice and coaching and, and really thinking about it. Communication is no different. The, the problem with communication is since we've all been doing it since we were young, we feel that we have a certain degree of, of aptitude. So we either don't focus on it because we think we're good at it or we know we're not good at it, but we're so embarrassed because we should be good at it because we've been doing it for so long. So we have to get rid of those attitudes and we really just have to focus on it. So lots of resources available. Thank you for sharing the ones I'm involved with, the Think Fast, Talk Smart podcast, the, the Speaking Up Without Freaking Out book, the Bold Echo Consulting, all of those are out there for people, but there are lots of other resources as well. Absolutely. I think all of those pointers are extremely useful, especially the first one where you mentioned that this needs to become a lifestyle habit and we can include it in the finer things that we do as opposed to looking at it at a mountain and keeping out separate time, which may not necessarily be possible. So I think that's amazing. Um, as we close down the episode, now that I have the pleasure of being on the other side, I want to flip the table and ask you the three same questions that you ask on your <laughs> podcast to every guest. Uh, and this is going to be an absolute honor. But for the first one, as you may be accustomed, what is the best piece of communication advice that you have received? And if you were to summarize that as a five to seven word presentation slide, what would that be? This is advice I heard from my mother and continue to hear from my mother. Uh, it is, I'm sure she did not originate it, but she has certainly propagated it. And it is, tell the time, don't build the clock. Many of us, especially founders, especially technical founders, go into too much detail too quickly. Just tell the time. And if the person you're interested in wants to know how you build the clock, then explain it. So tell the time, don't build the clock is the best advice I've ever heard and the advice I try to adhere to. Brilliant. Um, for the second question, which is one communicated that you truly admire and why? There are so many that I admire, but the one that I, I often point out to people is, is a woman named Brittany Packnett. And Brittany is a young woman, very passionate, very powerful in her communication. And the reason I, I highlight her is simply because she focuses on confidence and how to build confidence and the importance of confidence. And as I mentioned earlier, and uh, as an answer to a question you asked, confidence is key. It's a starting point. So Brittany not only has a really important and powerful message, she is an amazing dynamic speaker, somebody from whom we can all learn. And she has a wonderful TED talk. Again, her name is Brittany Packnett. Great, wonderful. I'm sure we're going to all catch that TED talk. For the last question, what are three ingredients that go into a sex, successful communication recipe? So as, as part of the consulting practice I co-founded, we spent a lot of time identifying what are the essential ingredients to effective communication. And to our mind, they boil down to what we call the three C's, confidence, connection, and being compelling. So you have to be confident in your demeanor, but also in the message that you're delivering. You have to be connected. That means it has to be relevant and specific to the audience you're talking to. And it needs to be compelling. Attention is the most precious commodity we have in the world today. And if you're not compelling, you won't command people's attention and therefore they won't hear what you're saying. So it's the three C's, confidence, connection, and being compelling. Wonderful. I think that's a wonderful close to what has been a spectacular conversation. Thank you so much, Matt, for sharing all of your insights from all the years of successful coaching to so many people and teaching that wonderful class at Stanford. Uh, I think this has been a delight and it is going to be extremely useful for everyone tuning in. Thank you so much. Thank you. And, and your, what you are doing is so important. And, and thank you for highlighting communication. <laughs>